Today we'll be looking at WPA Enterprise Hacking, uh, basically creating honeypots for WPA, WPA2, PSK networks. Uh, before we begin, just a quick introduction about us. Uh, I started as a programmer uh, and an architect, worked with Cisco Systems, found a bunch of Wi-Fi attacks. I run SecurityTube.net and Pentester Academy, uh, written a bunch of books, and we're actually releasing a new book uh, at our DEF CON vendor booth uh, called Make Your Own Hacker Gadget. I'll probably giving out a couple of these for free, you know, based on questions I ask and who can answer it. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Thomas. You probably already know me by uh, the nickname Mr. X. I'm the guy behind uh, Crack and G. Also, I have another project. Unfortunately, I haven't had much time to work on it, which is open webs, open source wireless IPS. And I created. Uh, the offsec uh, waifu, which is known these days as uh, wireless attacks. Uh, I spoke at a bunch of conventions in the US, in Mexico, in, uh, in Belgium. And I work for a company called Minerve. We are actually doing a lot of talks uh, at Black Hat and DEF CON combined. Uh, today at 3 o'clock, I'm also doing a Wi-Fi IDS talk for Windows called Chellam. I'll actually use Chellam and see how you can do a little bit of protection today. Uh, tomorrow, a network-based IDS, which actually uses SQL at its center to go ahead and run arbitrary queries. That's something we are doing tomorrow. And also, uh, another village talk here of how you can script your own Wi-Fi attack tools in Python using WPA supplicants, WPA control, and Dbus API. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever used it. OK, it's quite powerful for automation. Uh, and we also have a booth in the vendor area. So just go directly to the slides for WPA Enterprise. Okay, uh, at a very high level, when you look at WPA Enterprise, there are three entities, right? One, you have the client or the supplicant, which is providing authentication information. Then you have the access point, which is basically just an in-between proxy for all practical purposes. And you also have the authentication server, which is typically RADIUS which in turn can probably talk to LDAP or something else to you know, go ahead and authenticate the user based on the EAP mechanism being used. The most popular radius server is free radius. Uh, any of you have used free radius for this? OK, a couple of guys. Uh, which supports a ton of EAP techniques. Now, free radius, unfortunately, is a very well-behaved radius server, right? It's actually used in enterprises. It has a very legitimate uh, use for that matter. Now, when we go ahead and want to use it for our purposes and create honeypots, we would have to patch the free radius server. And that patch, which is available right now, is called the wireless spawnage edition, right, from Joshua Wright. Now, what does this patch actually do? Very simply put, it actually logs things like the MSCAP v2 challenge responses and a lot of other inner authentication which goes in the tunnel which we create, right? So that we can pick these inner auth details and then we can go and start cracking them. Now, if we look at WPA and WPA2 Enterprise, we have PEEP, TTLS, TLS, a bunch of others, some of which, which might not be used anymore. Uh, why is PEEP so popular? PEEP is the only EAP mechanism which Windows supports out of the box, right? That kind of made it de facto uh, the one with the highest amount of usage. So let's try and understand PEEP at a very uh, high level. The best analogy which I can use is SSL. Uh, how many of you here know how SSL works at a very high level? You know, not the crypto protocols and all of that, okay. So I'll just uh, go ahead and repeat some of the essential 
aspects of SSL. Uh, we create an encrypted tunnel, and within that encrypted tunnel, we send data, right? Which otherwise would have gone in plain text. Now, in the case of PEEP, the exact same process is followed. Phase one is creating the encrypted tunnel. In PEEP, this also happens using server-side certificates, just like in SSL. So once the tunnel is created, using the server-side certificate, which in the case of PEEP is the RADIUS server, we go ahead and send the inner authentication credentials, right? In the case of PEEP, the de facto inner auth is MSCAP v2, simple challenge response protocol. MSCAP v2 itself is known to be broken 100%. Uh, I think two or three years back, Moxie did a talk as well where I think they'd used GPU infrastructures and a couple of things uh, to go ahead and prove that you can crack it 100% of the times. So if you're thinking why MSCAP v2 is being used, well, the whole security here is maintained by ensuring the integrity of the tunnel itself, just like SSL. So if you're logging into Gmail or Google, the same username and password goes through, but it goes inside the encrypted SSL tunnel. If someone compromised that encrypted SSL tunnel by doing an MITM attack or an SSL strip attack, uh, then of course the username, password, or whatever gets sent inside the tunnel is also going to be available in plain text for the attacker doing the MITM. The exact same principle applies when we create MITM setups for WPA Enterprise. Uh, now, if you look at clients, in the case of Wi-Fi, you actually see very heterogeneous behavior in what a client does uh, or what is the default configuration of that client. So when you get an SSL pop-up, right, says there is a certificate issue, how many of you have at least clicked OK once in your lifetime? Couple of guys, okay. Uh, <laughs> never, never. <laughs> never? Okay. You know, keep in mind if you say never, that actually means you cannot log into your own security appliances because all of them use self signed certificates. Right? Quite, quite unusual, but pretty much all your firewalls, IDSs, anything you're running locally has self signed certs. So you must have at least clicked once. Uh, unless, of course, you've never uh, used one of those devices. Unencrypted. Unencrypted. <laughs> uh, okay. So when we look at Wi-Fi clients, there are broadly three different behaviors which can happen, right? Behavior one, the client has a very strict configuration, and the configuration enforces that if there is any certificate mismatch of any kind, silently drop the connection, do not prompt the user to accept new certificates, which might kind of go ahead and lead to, once again, the SSL MITM happening. That's possibility one. Uh, the second possibility is clients are misconfigured. Uh, this is something you'll actually find out of the box on most Android devices. How many of you have Android phones on you right now? Okay. Very, very notorious to actually have super bad configs uh, out of the box for enterprise, right? Uh, the simple reason is your Android vendor is not interested in maintaining the software and keeping things up to date. They just want the very first time you connect to a wireless network, uh, whether that is open or you know has, S, uh, has PEEP, you should probably just connect to it immediately. You know, if your connection breaks the very first time, you might actually think there's something wrong with your device, right? Uh, so make it kind of fail open out of the box. Uh, and we'll see that in the demo once we do it. How many of you have laptops here to kind of do the demos along with us in the second part? Okay, okay, perfect. So we have a bunch of access points. Uh, people who don't have, you can even share with guys who have. Uh, but we'll actually cover everything conceptually in the first half. So. Uh, folks who don't have a laptop can then probably uh, you know find something else interesting to look at. Uh, the third Wi-Fi uh, client behavior is typically what you see in the case of the browser world, right? We get a pop-up, so the client actually tells you that hey, there is a certificate problem. 
do you want to accept this go ahead with this right one of three possibilities uh, it depends on the version as an example of android it depends on devices and operating systems for example ios has a completely different interesting behavior which you shall see and your endpoints and what they are configured for okay so how does ssl man in the middle attack work now let's assume that i am the attacker gmail is the server the client is trying to access probably i mean thomas is the author of aircrack i can't point to him and say he's the vulnerable client right <laughs> so you know i can be okay <laughs> so he's the vulnerable client i'm the attacker creating the mitm setup and then you have gmail so when thomas tries to access gmail in a typical ssl mitm i send my own self signed fake certificate to thomas right uh, assuming thomas clicks okay or the client goes ahead and accepts the certificate because it's misconfigured the encrypted tunnel between thomas and me happens using my certificate now of course gmail isn't going to accept that same encrypted data so i'm going to create an encrypted tunnel between me the attacker and gmail using gmail certificate right so in an ssl mitm there are really two separate encrypted tunnels one between the attacker and the victim and the other between the attacker and the final destination server right the attacker encrypts decrypts puts it here again encrypts it sends it to gmail and all the data flows back and forth when we create a honey pot for a peep based network the principle is exactly the same i as an attacker i'm going to go ahead spin up my vm advertise a network with the same ssid as that of your enterprise at the back end i'm going to be running my own fake radius server which has its own self signed certificate so let's say you know thomas now sends out probe requests and i create a honey pot with the exact same name you know at an airport or any other uh, location and thomas connects to my setup now peep typically is network log on so thomas if this is the first time he's connecting which wouldn't be the case because he's sending probe requests most clients automatically try to do a connection right they might not even prompt you during the demos you do well you will be prompted because the network isn't there in your preferred network list yet right this is your first connection so when thomas connects to me at that point uh, a fake certificate would be sent to him now everything depends on how his wireless client software behaves right possibility 1 silently accepts android devices do that and you'll see that during the demo possibility 2 the device goes ahead and shows him a certificate mismatch and he may have to accept it right ios devices would do that possibility 3 a very strong policy where the device automatically rejects at right? very few devices some which have been configured typically after our black hat classes so uh here is what i'm going to do i'm going to create the setup uh just sort of give me a minute or two and then i'll show you how it works just ask question but okay do do you guys have any questions so far so the question was why a virtual machine yes it could be a, a physical machine too just convenient we have the slides on one machine and we need a linux machine to to do that
good looks so yeah just let me just ask if someone can explain the cafe latte regions of the is there anybody that could explain the cafe latte attack so there is a book for the person who can answer that so you're going to ask some questions about different wireless attacks while i'm setting it up and you can answer it get a free book yeah. can somebody describe the cafe latte attack Okay, how does Cafe Latte, I'll be very, very specific, how does Cafe Latte go ahead? Uh, so Cafe Latte is AP-less web cracking, right? Uh, one of the very first attacks uh, which I found. Uh, and Cafe Latte does something very, very interesting with the initial R packets which comes in. So what does it exactly do? Uh, the other alternate questions are, how does the Corec attack work? Right, anyone heard of the Corec attack? Okay, or the chop chop attack. Okay. How PSK cracking works. Yeah. Okay, does anyone want to explain how WPA PSK cracking works? Okay, there you go. So I'll give this a shot. Uh, basically, when you're connecting to a wireless router, you have to send your, uh, your information about who you are and uh, what your physical device is so that you can um, establish this connection with the server. And there's a four-way handshake that occurs where you're sending information to the router, it sends information back, you send more information to the router, and finally it sends more information back. And in the process of that four-way handshake, one of the things that's being, uh, that's being transferred is the hash of the, of the WPA um, access point, you know, the passphrase or whatever authentication it's using. So you can e extract that hash uh, from the packets and then use it to brute force the password. Yep, very good. PSK without an access point being around, uh, which is AP less WPA, WPA2 PSK cracking. How do you create such a setup and how would that work? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, how, how do we deal with uh, when we don't have the access point around? Yes. You're on the right track. There's a, there's a, there are tools to. Yeah, there's a tool in air crack that can do. Uh, Airmon is just for creating or stopping monitor mode interfaces. Say it. Yeah, that's one answer. There's uh, another tool in Aircrack. Yep. Yep. Okay, so managed to get the setup ready. Uh, the very first thing which you're going to create is the fake access point, right? Which has the same SSID as the enterprise AP. So here is what we are trying to do create an enterprise access point with the same SSID as yours. When the client connects to it, our fake AP will talk to the radius server which we've set up with the self-signed certificate. As soon as the connection happens, the self-signed cert is sent to the client. The client now has a choice, as I said, one of those three. Assuming it accepts the encrypted tunnel which gets created, is with the fake radius server certificate, just like SSL man-in-the-middle attack. 
Once that happens, the MSCAP V2 challenge response pair inside gets sent and we can easily cache it. So I'll go through the whole process. Uh, the first step is actually to create the host APD config. Host APD is a good choice because it can work with EPOL packets, right? That is a requirement for any software-based access point. All hardware APs can do that, right? So here is the WPA enterprise configuration for host APD. Uh, we have the interface, we have the hardware mode, the channel, the driver, SSID. WPA enterprise is always open authentication. You selected WPA2 and key management is going to be EAP. And we are using CCMP so that it's WPA2 PS, uh, WPA2 enterprise. 802.1x is set to on. I am running the radius server on the same machine, right? So that I can actually use the loopback interface. And my access point using host APD uh, is actually going to be on my client card. Okay, this is... Yeah, you want to I want to mention the name of the card. So this is a TP-Link WN722N. It's a fantastic card, has an Athros-based chipset. Highly recommend purchasing one. Uh, when we checked during our Black Hat class, it was retailing at $12 on Amazon. You probably want to buy 10 of them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult to... Uh, yeah, kind of they run out of stock very fast. And it's difficult to get you know your hands on them. I mean, we did a class of 40, 50 people and took quite some time to actually get that many cards. So highly recommend buying one. Uh, TP-Link WN722N, 722N. OK. So I'm going to go ahead and start the fake access point. And then I'm going to start the radius server. And now I'm actually going to go ahead and connect my client to it. I know most of you already have your alpha cards out to deauth the AP. Just give me a couple of minutes and then you can deauth as much as you like. Uh, so as soon as I try to connect, it shows me a username and password prompt. It realizes it's WPA Enterprise. Uh, I'm going to just put in, let's say, Vivek demo123, hit join. Now on iOS devices, this actually shows me a certificate, right? At this point, this is the default bootstrap certificate. So kind of looks completely easy to detect. It says example cert, but we could actually change it to something which looks more legitimate. Once we accept the cert, uh, of course, we get an incorrect username and password. But if we go back and look at the log files, just started this. But hey, Here we go, right? Let me go ahead and do this once again. So it, and there you go, right? Uh, here is something you can try. Using your own mobile devices, try connecting to this network and see if you actually get a certificate error. Don't worry, no malware will be served. <laughs> Today. Right? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, yeah. The SSID of the network is... hyphen ENT demos. The deauth guys in the room, just a couple of more seconds. <laughs> and then you can play with it. <laughs> and everyone who's trying, uh, you know, try not to be too profane about what you put in as the username. Right? We all understand we should be hacked, but yeah, <laughs> there go. <laughs> I, 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 I hope you're a woman. <laughs> Seriously? Writing this. <laughs> That's better. Uh, well, I'd agree to that, as I said, you know, only if you're a woman. <laughs> uh, people who are trying, how many of you got a certificate error? 
an actual certificate error. iOS device? Okay. Androids, anyone tried with Androids? Did not get a certificate error, right? There you go. Now, if this was your enterprise network, an actual enterprise network configured, uh, your device would just automatically connect to it without you even knowing when you're in the proximity of it. Right, and Androids are very, very notorious for this. It's unbelievable. I get to do this demo almost for the last three years now. Right, nothing much has changed. Now, can you go ahead and fix this on Android? Yes, you can. Deep down in the settings, you have to figure out the place which says validate certificate. Right, if you manage to figure that out, where it is, depending on the version of Android, hey, you are protected. To begin with, there are a couple of other interesting hacks which we can do as well, uh, which I'll just show you in a bit. People who are trying, anyone else Android device or any other devices, the Windows phone? Anyone with the Windows phone? Okay, that shows market share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Win Windows is, uh, the good thing about Windows to some extent now is because the entire Wi-Fi stack and the security has evolved along with the OS itself, most of what you see on the phone is just that getting ported. So, uh, Androids are bad, really bad. Now, for people using iOS devices, there isn't much to celebrate immediately, right? This is a tech audience. The certificate name is a dead giveaway, example cert. Uh, but how many non-technical folks in a company, when we can actually make the certificate look extremely legit, would go ahead and not click okay to that, right? If we actually said, okay, this is ABC Corp, you know, put in all the details as well. All iOS also says is, hey, do you want to go ahead and accept this certificate? iOS isn't specifically warning you what can happen if you do it, right? So it's great, at least that it does it to begin with, but hey, there are no warnings. It just says this is a new certificate. Do you want to accept it? Now, the problem is if you accept it, it's cached forever. Why? Because on iOS, the only time you can remove a network is when you're in its vicinity. Do you notice that? You can never remove preferred networks on iOS devices unless you jailbreak it, find the right SQLite DB where all of that is stored, and actually run a SQL delete command for all rows. Okay. Uh, I haven't checked with that. Just let me know. Uh, I have my email at the end, so if the reset networking does that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So all of uh, your cached passwords and things like that, including, of course, the wireless ones, are all in the keychain. I think the file name was keychain-2.db or something. Uh, the last time I kind of jailbroke and had a look at it. Uh, yeah, it's just an encrypted SQLite DB, but you can decrypt it very easily uh, using the machine key which is there on the iOS device. So once you jailbreak it, you can recover it. There was question. question. Uh, is when you connect to the network and use a username and password, does it silently fail? No, it says um, certificate rejected. Okay, so that is an example of probably a strong policy, uh, just like Chrome does for its browser. So great, you know, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. So just so you guys know, uh, uh, iOS has reset, ne uh, reset network settings. Okay. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, it's still there. Because, I mean, I think maybe logically what happens is you accept a certificate that probably goes elsewhere, uh, you know, on a system wide certificate database or system wide certificate bank rather than being stored as part of the config of the network profile. So, that could probably be a logical assumption as to why res uh, resetting networking isn't solving the problem. Right? How many of you have tried and not gotten certificate errors? And okay, Android device is notorious. Uh, you can actually change it uh, if you go deep down in the settings somewhere, but it's quite painful to do that. Now, what is the biggest worry with WPA Enterprise? 
in the case when you were actually cracking WPA, WPA2, PSK, what you were getting is at most a network key, which the admin can change or you know make it very, very extremely difficult to actually crack. In the case of enterprise, if you do a parking lot attack or probably roam around in the nearest coffee shop near the enterprise, assuming they have a couple of Android devices uh, on their employees, this is something quite easy to pick up. Keep in mind that all you needed was a quick exchange. This doesn't require, unlike something like web, for thousands of different packets to pass by, right? Uh, this whole exchange is probably under 60 packets, 50 to 60 packets. Uh, at the very same time, the interesting part is once you crack the challenge response pair, I'll show you what tools are available uh, and online there are even infrastructures which you can use. What do you finally get? You actually get the user's credentials. The user name actually goes in plain text in the EAP packet itself. So if you actually just ran Wireshark and put a filter on you know, EAP logon, you would be able to harvest usernames on an enterprise network anyway. This has nothing to do with uh, it going inside the encrypted tunnel. It's also available outside. So you can just run a scanner near an enterprise and do username harvesting. Uh, once you get the password, what you can actually do is log on on that network as that user. Because anyone using peep actually has network logon associated with it, right? The Radius server talks to the LDAP and just logs you on as the current user. What that means is once you do that, you have access to the common shared file systems. Uh, the best way from here to go to root is most companies actually also have webmail and because they have single sign-on available, you can actually just find the webmail URL and log into his email using the same username and password. Right? And then if you have one of those interesting little PDF attacks where you can package in you know, some goodies, you could actually send an internal email to all of his colleagues. Uh, the email system won't reject it because it isn't fake email, right? It's actually legitimate email from one to the other. Uh, so this could be a very good starting point for, and now this is when everybody appreciates the talk, an APT, right? Advanced Persistent Threat. So. A very easy uh, you know, illustration of how you can move from just Wi-Fi to network credentials and then trying to see how many more users you can attack on uh, the enterprise network. Right? Questions? Questions? Uh, it's just MSCHAP v2. So MSCHAP v2 is well documented of how the challenge response pairs are created can probably dig up uh, some documentation and share it with you. Now, MSCHAP v2 itself is known to be broken. Uh, previously, we used to use ASLEAP to run a dictionary attack on it, which is what I can show you right now. Uh, but I think three years back, Moxie and David Halton, right? Moxie and David Halton, they did a talk where how you can actually crack MSCHAP v2 uh, using a cloud or a GPU infrastructure 100% of the times. It's a DEF CON talk, you can see it. Uh, I think they even released some sample code along with it. And they have a website called cloudcracking.com or something where, cloudcracker.com where uh, you can pay $17 and save yourself a lot of time, right? I mean, in case you're doing a pen test uh, on a per hash basis. Okay. Uh, so how do you protect against this? <laughs> All of this is going to be even more worrisome as the internet of things and all of that comes in and everything uses Wi-Fi, right? IoT devices almost always use Wi-Fi as the way to connect to the internet. Some of them use uh, 3G networks as well, but most of them. Okay, so let's actually go ahead and look at the secure configuration. Uh, depending on your client device, you have to validate certificate. You have to make it idiot proof, right? Do not prompt user to authorize new servers or trusted CAs. Unbelievably, Microsoft has this, right? They have it in their config which you can turn on, right? So that's how you secure it. No, that is in the default state. But is this secure? I mean, you just took my word for it. This is actually more insecure 
Then the last one. And the interesting thing is that when we used to do a lot of audits, uh, the only thing I did when I had to do WP Enterprise auditing was just have them open up this setting. right? And the moment I see this, well, it's game over already. And now I can actually do a whole network-wide attack without even having to worry about a certificate pop-up. Right? Yeah. Can you repeat the statement as far as it's part? Okay. So if you look at the entire attack which we discussed, we said the problem is certificate validation probably isn't turned on by default on most client devices, right? So here is a config where certificate validation is turned on. We've kind of made it, you know, kind of user proof, which is do not prompt the user to authorize new servers, which means there are going to be no pop-ups asking the user to accept a new certificate from a network. Uh, so this is fantastic. And actually, many networks have exactly this. But this is way more easier to beat than the previous case. And if I see this, it's like game over already. Of course, I build the client still for seven days. <laughs> right? Roam around you know, with my interns, <laughs> trying to look all stressed out, when all we're actually doing is playing a game against each other, right? A video game. And that's the reason why we're stressed out. And then after seven days, we come back. And here you go. This was difficult. No, no, no. We, <laughs> we never do that in case you're probably thinking of hiring us. <laughs> so anyone, uh, this goes out one book. Why is this insecure? Yeah. OK, but how would I find the legitimate cert? I mean, in the sense, how would I know what is a legitimate cert for the enterprise? OK. OK, very good. So one of, here you go, clap. <laughs> so one of the things you probably noticed is the admin forgot to add connect to these servers, and there are no domain names mentioned here. So all that means is you need a valid certificate from one of these CAs, right? Thwart A is an example. On most of your Windows systems, you'd actually find a couple of dozen CAs, and you can purchase a certificate from any one of them, use it in your Radius server, and now that is a valid certificate right? for the chain of trust which you have. So this is a very common mistake in enterprises. Now the best part is once your fake AP and Radius server uses a valid cert, all your devices would happily connect. I mean, because we are playing by the rules now. right? Easiest case. Uh, and this configuration, super easy to abuse. Unfortunately, nobody wants to go through the pain of setting up PKI and all of that locally. right? And even people who do are always worried of what they could break. So they don't try to really constrain it by the FQDNs and domain names and all of that. Uh, you actually need a very good experienced PKI team to get all of this right. And not many enterprises invest in that. Of course, some of them have secure configs. And this is something you can check in your enterprise uh, to begin with. How many of you use WP Enterprise, PEEP, TTLS? OK. You can check on your laptops or on your devices. Right? Have you seen that on Windows 10? Uh, on Windows 10, I still haven't uh, opened this up and checked it yet. The only way is Microsoft would have to go ahead and prompt you at this point when you click OK that you've forgotten to mention you know, which domain names for, this, uh, for which this should be valid. Right? That's the only way. So now that we've looked at the attack part of it, um, and I'll show you the ASLEEP part later because uh, that part is quite insignificant to do. It's just a command line tool. Uh, how do you protect against such attacks? So I mean, how can you protect yourself from someone who just created a fake AP with the same SSID? Okay, So that is really where, uh, just give you a sneak preview of the antidote. Uh, I created Chellum, uh, which is my DEF CON main stage talk today at 3 o'clock, so in case you get interested. But I'll show you how many of these can be mitigated using a Wi-Fi firewall locally. So Chellum at least in my humble view, is the world's first 
pure Wi-Fi firewall IDS for Windows endpoints. You can extrapolate the same concept uh, to any operating system. We're already working on a Linux version of it, but Windows is actually more difficult to work on simply because it is quite restrictive of what you can get from the different APIs. Also, the only way in Windows now that you can go ahead and do really good quality sniffing and packet monitoring if you write your own call-out intermediate drivers, uh, something which we are working on for version 2. So let me run Chellam. It starts with a cool-looking ninja. The ninja changes color. Uh, I have four different colors. You kind of go around it every time it starts. Uh, how does Chellam work? It actually reconstructs how the access point beacon would look like using different Windows APIs, right? So we look at the Wi-Fi subsystem in Windows and pull out a ton of data from that. And then I reconstruct how a beacon frame would look like. Once I do that, we can actually see the AP's beacon frame and try to see what we can fingerprint. Now, uh, Chellum has out-of-the-box detection for attack networks for some of them, fingerprinted. Uh, I think actually someone is running Airbase NG with an SSID default. Anyone here? Okay, it's actually picked it up. Uh, I'll come to how that does it in a, a little later. Uh, here is another as well. So you're going to see a lot of pop-ups today. So it actually shows you that uh, Lotor Coffee, as an example, uh, is actually created using a fake AP. Or probably this is Airbase responding to probe responses and one of them got picked up. Uh, come to do this a little later. Let me actually go to the settings and pull down at least some of the alerts. So Chellum begins with trying to be a better wireless scanner. Uh, what I did is I saw a lot of tools like Insider, but I wasn't happy personally with the way they were handling a lot of the data. Now, Windows does something very, very funny. My DEF CON talk is going to be quite noisy, which means people can project stuff. Mm, I didn't know that. Uh, so what Chellum does is it actually looks at the different APIs. And unfortunately, Windows's wireless manager doesn't give you a lot of this information. right? It just gives you the SSIDs. That's about it. Chellum can actually pick up the individual SSIDs and look at the actual BSSIDs behind them. Not just that, it can actually pull out a ton of other information. Like example, the frequency, the auth. Uh, this is going to be a completely free tool which I'll be releasing today. Uh, anyone can download and use it after my uh, main talk at DEF CON. So, actually gives you a lot of information so depending on what you'd like to look at. Uh, it can actually even show you, yep, Chellam found me. Okay. Who tried that? Okay. Uh, maybe I deserve a little clap for that. <laughs> so you tried a black box kind of a thing in the sense I didn't know. Uh, so you can actually figure out fake APs. You can actually write your own fingerprints. Uh, this one has an older one, I think for Airbase and a couple of other tools, but you could write your own fingerprints if you wanted. Uh, but Chellum does both blacklisting and whitelisting. That's kind of the more interesting part. Blacklists will never work eventually. It's always going to be a game where you know, you're know trying to fingerprint the latest version of a tool. So that wouldn't help. So how does Chellum work? Uh, we reconstruct the beacon frames. So if I click on details, what I've actually done is using the APIs, we reconstruct how the beacon frame looks like, all the different information elements and all of that stuff. Now keep in mind, I am not sniffing. This does not require custom drivers. This does not require custom hardware. This will work on any Windows system, uh, Windows 7 and above, right? And compatible hardware. So you could actually plug in any card and this would work, right? That was one of the design goals I had in mind when I started working on this is, you know, I didn't want people to kind of find the right hardware, right? Uh, so Chellum shows me all of this. Now, let me actually show you 
how we could go ahead and create a firewall. So once we can actually look at the different beacon frames, or rather reconstruct the different beacon frames, we should be able to create a signature for an access point. Now, how would that actually work? Is that your attack tool complaining about Chillam? <laughs> Someone already built in a little alarm saying Chillam's around? <laughs> so uh, how do we go ahead and fingerprint uh, a network, right? Unfortunately, I'm sorry about the pop-ups. Uh, I have to disable it. So what we actually do is once we reconstruct the beacon frame, I can actually pick up the different IEs from the beacon and start fingerprinting how my home AP looks like. Now, how do wireless attackers work? You sniff the air, you look at probe requests, and you create fake APs with the same SSID, right? At an airport, no one can know the different IEs, or at least some of them which your home AP uses. No one can know the BSSID of your access point, right? So Chellum allows you to go ahead and create a rule set based on that. Uh, how difficult is it to create the rule set? Quite easy. Can actually go down, find the right network. So I have a little network in here called uh, Open Sysim somewhere. Uh, Chellam can also find hidden SSID networks. That's why you see a lot of the hidden SSID stuff up there. OK, here it is. So let's say this is my home network. Now, if I wanted to create a rule to whitelist this home network, all I would have to do is right click and say create rule. Now, what this does is it will pick up all the different IEs which I now recreated based on what I got from the Wi-Fi subsystems and the different APIs. Uh, and this actually creates quite an interesting rule. Let me dismiss this real quick. OK, one of the things is the the tool just refreshes. There you go. So now, this actually allows you to create your own Wi-Fi firewall rule. At least to the best of my knowledge, this is the world's first. Right? Uh, how do we work with this? We can actually create a rule. can enable the rule. Now, unlike a wired side IDS, what I figured out in the case of wireless, there are two times roughly when you probably want to find something wrong is going on. The first is when you're connecting to a network. And the second is there is an attack network with the same SSID as ones you're probing for. right? So you can tell Shellum to check at both or one of those stages. Let's go for both right now. Now, Chellam has automatically filled up a lot of the info, for example, the BSSID. And this can actually be multiple ones as well. I apologize for the pop-ups. Kind of, I have to change the code to quickly kind of make, a, make that change. Uh, and we can actually say, can this change or not? No, the BSSID can't change. No, this will always be infrastructure. No, this is going to have this exact same physical layer. And if I'm on a fixed channel, no, this can't change as well. Now, one of the other interesting things which I figured out is the attacker can never figure out your neighboring APs. So I also go ahead and create a list of the neighboring APs. Uh, and you can tell Chellam that at least one of them or more of them have to be around any time you see open Sysim. Okay? Uh, the attacker in the wild would never be able to figure this out. So if this isn't, those APs aren't around, then Chellam knows something is wrong, or it's probably 3 a.m. in the night, right? But 
Uh, you can configure that if you want, or you can just let it be. Right now, I can just say, okay, it's fine, it's simply because people are running stuff and many of these APs might not be around. Then you have capability information, and then you have all of the beacon frame information, right? And I can actually tell Chellam that this is the only set of beacon IEs which may be allowed. So I can actually say, well, new IE elements cannot be present. If it is, then that's an anomaly. So now I go back and I can say create rule. Okay, rule created. Uh, now I can go back to my attacker setup. Yes, uh, the entire parameter is something you can completely configure. Now keep in mind, an attacker in the wild can never guess all the parameters correctly. Is this impossible? How do you know all the parameters in the IE? How do you know the BSS ID of the fake AP of my home AP? Oh, but you're at the airport, and I'm talking about my home AP and my uh, access point at my office, right? Actually, even if you sniff all the parameters and create an identical replica, still Chellam has some intelligence. I'll get to that. It has something to do with clock skews. So that's prob Was that? it's possible, but it's not probable. Yeah. It's, it's possible, and that could be the case when someone actually follows you to your home and kind of clones your AP, then you have bigger problems than <laughs> Wi-Fi issues, right? <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so what I did is when I architected it, I actually made all the rules and everything go inside a SQLite database. So you can just copy the rules.db to any machine, start Chellum, and automatically picks up those rules. Uh, maybe later on, if people like the tool, want to use it, we might spend more time, you know, kind of refining and creating a front-end tool. Right now, this is complete freeware. Uh, okay, so now let me go ahead and create a fake access point with the same name. Okay. So it takes a couple of, uh, probably a minute or so, simply because Windows only scans once per minute. And that's when we get the results. Windows also caches results from time to time. So we might not get the AP immediately. Might take a couple of seconds. And now I don't have host APD's signature in Chellam. But there you go. Do you notice Chellam actually found it? And it says that, hey, looks like a rule set was hit, open Sizem, and this was the issue. Now, Chellam does something interesting. This is the part which is still a little buggy from a view perspective, so I apologize if you just see a crash. But you can actually view, and Chellam will tell you what was different because of which it actually flagged it. Uh, rules which you haven't forced where anything is just, okay, this can change, those are all green. So it tells you the BSS ID didn't match, the center frequency didn't match. Uh, some of the capability information didn't, and most of the IEs never matched. So Chellam tells you, hey, you configured me uh, and told me that when you see open Sizem, you should actually see all of those IEs as well with certain values, but I don't see those when I see open Sizem right now at the airport, right, or at DEF CON. So this definitely is, is not the AP you're typically used to connecting to, right? Personally, I think it's going to be very, very hard to beat something like this. Uh, the only way is if you have complete full knowledge of the access points you're cloning or trying to create fake AP against. Of course, apart from software bugs, right? Here I'm talking about conceptually the idea itself. Right. Right. So basically, what is the design goal really? Uh, it's there in my DEFCON slides, but I can just pull up what was my design goal behind it. Just kind of go ahead and stop Chellum for a second. I had too many alerts right now. Okay. 
Uh, my first design goal when I started was to build a better wireless scanner. I wasn't happy with what was there, at least on Windows. Uh, and a lot of people, at least who aren't very Linux aware, unfortunately don't know how to go ahead and use something like AeroDump or some of these other tools. This can actually even run on your uh, Surface Pro or any of those devices as well, right? Any Windows system. The second thing which I wanted was that it should be able to learn networks you connect to, right? Similar to most IDSs, you have to decide what the baseline is, which is the first time you connect to your home network, you actually say, hey, this is the one which is whitelisted. You decide what to whitelist. Uh, the same goes for Office as well. Can Chellam tell you, look at a new network, a Starbucks, and tell you, is this good or bad? No. It's the same thing as you can't look at an EXE and say if it's malware or not. I mean, you can run your heuristics, but you're as good as what you have. However, you can go to your nearby Starbucks for the first time and actually go ahead and add a rule set for your home Starbucks, right? So after that, if someone does create a Starbucks, Chellam can actually tell you this isn't the Starbucks you're used to. Now, Chellam can actually even deal with multiple BSSIDs or multiple values. I'm gonna shut it down, but you can right click, create a rule on just an SSID and it'll automatically pick up many of the BSSIDs it sees around. So this rule would actually be like an aggregate rule for multiple SSID, BSSID combinations, right? Of course, uh, the only time that would work is if you know, most of those APs are similar or else you would be significantly diluting the rule by having to ignore the differences between different APs. If you have a wireless controller as in an enterprise, this won't be a problem at all because you have the exact same uh, characteristics kind of push to all the endpoints or all the access points, right? Uh, any, any other question about this? Uh, that's a very good question. So what do we depend on right now uh, is the wireless subsystems. So let me, this could be interesting. Uh, this is more of the architecture of the tool. Just gonna start with a clean slate just so that everyone can see how that changes. Okay, now what do we do? We, we do not sniff the air, at least for version one, okay? Uh, so we look at the entire Wi-Fi subsystem and pull all of that data out from Wi-Fi APIs, little events happening on the network subsystem. So if I actually go in here, you'll automatically notice Chellam gives you a scan complete, WLAN notification scan complete, WLAN notification network available, right? So in Windows, all of these different subsystems are continuously interacting, raising events, sending stuff to each other. Uh, I'll disable the alerts for a second. And we can actually go and configure which exact events of the subsystem you want Chellam to monitor, right? So when I was building it, uh, I wasn't very sure about what events give me what data. Each of these events actually gives me ton of data. So then I had to go on and parse all of those event data logs and look at, okay, you know, this is interesting, this isn't. But then we finally went ahead and kind of created an interface where you could select the events you want to log. So at this point, some of these events have happened per se, and that's the reason why we have it on scanning mode. So if you are connected to an access point, once we get an event which says connected, you're already connected. We could disable the interface and disconnect you, the Windows subsystem informs us that it has happened. What are we doing in Chellam version two? I'm actually writing an intermediate driver, which will sit above the mini port, just below the protocol driver. And this will actually look at all the packets which basically go up and down from the mini port to the protocol. So when we go ahead and say that, hey, this is the AP beacon we would like to whitelist, then the intermediate driver sitting down below sees an attack traffic for the same SSID and automatically drops it exactly the same way as wired side 
personal firewalls work today, right? They have a kernel mode component which does this. So we would do the exact same thing, and all you would see is a little alert saying the threat was mitigated. But the only way is going to be a callout driver or an intermediate driver. Microsoft's recommended way right now is to write a callout driver. There isn't any documentation at all, so it kind of takes some time to find it out. Second, uh, once I had the initial driver ready, what I figured is it has to be co-signed by Microsoft now for Windows 10 uh, and above. So the co-signing might take us some amount of time to achieve. But uh, in the next four months, you should probably see the callout driver version available as well. Of course, it takes some time to even check the drivers are stable or not, right? If the driver crashes, your system crashes. Right now, uh, Chellum can run comfortably. You can even disable your wireless and Chellum wouldn't crash or complain, simply because it depends on the event-based systems. Uh, any any questions? This will be complete freeware, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have to enable validate certificates. From what I've seen, if you don't enable validate certificates, uh, regardless of whatever servers you've mentioned, uh, should kind of allow you. I mean, at least in, a, in Windows 7, I had checked that when I initially tried it, but you can try it out. Logically, unless you enforce validate certificate, well, everything else is insecure, regardless of whether you have the names in or not. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you just have to go ahead and add your certificate in there and remove the rest, right? Actually, a lot of uh, enterprise firewalls do deep packet inspection using exactly that technique. They would add the firewall certificate as like a root CA certificate on your list of certs, and then that transparently issues certificates for any of the domains you're trying to access, and then they can actually look inside the packet. So yes, and you have to just remove the rest of them. You could do that. Questions? Okay, great. Uh, so we have around 20 minutes, and let's do a quick demo uh, for people who are around, and you know, we can help out. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can you can ask us. Right? WPA, WPA Enterprise, or anything related to Wi-Fi security. Here is the resident expert. Uh, any questions of error dump? I mean, every single time Thomas demos error dump in the classes we teach together, I learn some new stuff, some new interesting feature which I never knew about. So, hey, you know, if you had error dump questions, he's your guy. Okay, so we'll start the labs. Uh, does everyone have a Kali VM? Whoever wants to do the labs live, and then I can go through the processes step by step. And uh, as I said, I'm doing a 3 o'clock uh, talk today on Chellum, and I'm doing a 12 o'clock talk tomorrow uh, in DEF CON on creating your own network IDS by taking PCAP files, converting the packets into SQL SQLite database tables, and then running arbitrary queries on them. So if you always thought of how you could begin with network forensics for Wi-Fi, that talk can be interesting, right? But beware, things may crash. I mean, looking at the kind of traffic I see, uh, I'm, my tool is really being tested. So, but I have videos. Uh, so, just in case everything crashes and burns. Okay, uh, let's start the labs. Okay. How many of you want to try out the labs? Okay, can can everyone just move to this side? It's just easier for us to probably move around and help you out. Uh, and you can just raise your hand so that we know you have a laptop and you want to do the labs, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we have seven people here.
taking pictures at any time. I probably will only go after my DEF CON talk, maybe at like 4 o'clock or something. Who else wanted to participate? Okay. Oh, sure. And if you're in the vendor area, uh, we're giving out the Hacker Gadget and the Linux Forensic Book together at $40. So uh, the Hacker Gadget book is really how to create your own supercharged Wi-Fi pineapple using OpenWRT. So you can actually go ahead and install OpenWRT, port all the packages and all of that on it, and then you can create your own pineapple if you want. Or you can just plug on the pineapple and enjoy whatever you like to do. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start the labs given we have uh, less amount of time. Okay, uh, so there are two ways to go ahead and create an access point using uh, either an external access point, such as the TP-Link one which you have, or you can create an internal one using host APD, like the one which I did, right? Uh, both of them are pretty much equivalent, so we'll use the external one because we don't have enough wireless cards for all of you. Okay, uh, so in the case that you have a real access point, the setup would work like this, right? I have my Kali VM running inside VirtualBox, and I have my network connection, which is bridged to my wired adapter, okay? This is important because we want the access point to be able to talk to the radius server directly. So you have to bridge it. Uh, at the very same time, the TP link which you've been given has a switch on the side. Ensure it is set to 3G, 4G. That's the default config. I know, you know, most of us when we see a switch, we have to toggle it. But if you change it from 3G, 4G to anything else, the DHCP server will stop.
Now once you once you do that, you can start your Kali VM. Ensure you plug in the Ethernet connection of the access point as well. Okay. Okay, uh, if any of you do not have free radius D installed, then I'm just passing a USB, you can just copy it inside your VM, right? You can copy it and pass it around. The process actually is quite simple uh, to configure and install free radius. Uh, you can just have a look on the screen uh, while the USB is being passed around. Yeah. So once you go ahead and unzip the USB, uh, sorry, unzip the file Wi-Fi class.zip on the USB, uh, you can go to a directory called WPAENT for enterprise. And there is a little file in here called Kali.txt. This just contains very simple commands to untar, patch, and compile and install free radius WPE. Yeah, yeah. I think this, this, do you remember who wrote this patch? Uh, no, I, I have an updated patch somewhere. Okay, okay. Post it soon. And you can just run the file. I mean, and should automatically compile and install free radius D.
if you have the USB, you can pass it around, or if you have Radius D already installed with you. Uh, you can just run the dot slash Kali dot txt. I mean, these are just shell commands, so it'll automatically run it. You don't have to type any of those in. Right, once you have the zip file, you could just run it as a bash script. I mean, I've called it a dot txt, but it would just run. It just untars the free radius server, patches it, and just does the regular make, make, install, and ld config just to ensure all the libraries are immediately available for use. Okay, uh, so because we are so close to running out of time, I'll just show you how to go through the process just after this. Uh, okay, so let me. Okay. So uh, once you do that, the process is actually quite straightforward. It isn't complicated at all. So just have a look at the screen, and you can try it out. You know, in case we run out of time. Uh, once you download, install, and compile this, uh, you just have to configure your Radius server on both the access point, first to begin with. So the default IP address of the AP is 192.168.0.254, the one you have, or later on, whichever one you use. And you can find the WPA settings. We're going to wireless. Security. Wireless security. And then you can fill up the appropriate IP address. You can easily find what IP address you have through the Kali VM. And if you notice the IP address given to me by the router, because I've kind of bridged the interfaces, is 198.168.0.101. Pretty much all of you should have that as well because that's the first IP address to be handed out in the range. So we can put in that IP address. The radius port 1812 is always the same unless you've changed it for some reason in the config. And then you have something called the radius password. So let's actually figure out how to set this up. So we'll have to go to the radius server config directory, just at user local TC. User local etc rad db. Now this contains all of your radius server config files. Uh, the certificate which you generate and all of that. So we can generate a temporary certificate if we wanted to by going inside certs and then just typing dot slash bootstrap. Okay. And once you do that, we can then finally go to a file called clients.conf. 
where we have to give a range for the client to the radius server. The access point is the radius server's client. Right, so we can actually go in there and this should be line 196 in the clients.conf and you can just uncomment this section. So as you can notice, the shared secret is testing 123-1, which is this here. You already set it. And then you can save your settings, restart your router if it prompts you. And at the other end, now all you have to do is start the radius server with the hyphen S hyphen X option. So once you do that, when a client connects to the access point, the AP will start talking over EAP to the radius server. And all of those messages would be encapsulated, go back and forth. The fake certificate would be put out. And then the attack would be conducted. I'll just show you that in a bit. OK, so I'll just show you the last step. And you know we've kind of finished our time. But you can set your laptops up at the back. Uh, and we can help you out, people who would like to do the demos. Right? OK, thank you. OK, guys, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you want to do the demos, you can just set it up in the back, and we'll be there to help you. Thanks.